we're seeing transformation whether we want it or not. I think that the the evidence of climate impacts is just ever growing and the speed at which we're facing transformation of our world is becoming ever more clear. I mean, in the, the before pandemic times, everybody was worried about the burning of the Amazon and the burning of Australia. And so this is this transformation is happening. And the question is, what are we going to do to change the way that humanity functions to, to maintain some version of climate stability and safety? Welcome to the EcoPolitics podcast. This podcast series tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. I'm Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa, and my co-host for the show is Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University, although he's not joining us for this episode. In this episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Matthew Hoffman, Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto, and Dr. Stephen Bernstein, Distinguished Professor of Global Environmental and Sustainability Governance at the University of Toronto. And both uh, uh, co-direct the Environmental Governance Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, along with Dr. Teresa Kramers. We will be talking about a couple key concepts today in this episode uh, about the study of environmental politics and climate change governance in particular, including ideas like the global commons, decarbonization, and the idea of lock-in or carbon lock-in. Uh, Matt and Stephen recently co-authored an article in the journal Nature Climate Change called Climate Politics Metaphors and the Fractal Carbon Trap, which offers a really good foundation for our discussion today and which we will be sure to link to on the website. So before we get into the meaty stuff, Matt, Stephen, how are you guys doing? Stephen, how's your pandemic summer, the great pandemic summer of 2020 going? Well, it's uh, pretty isolating, I think, like a lot of people. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think puts things in perspective, but like everyone trying to make the best of it, enjoy the warm weather <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, not think too much about, uh, about what the fall is going to look like. Great. And how about you, Matt? So I use the term uh, COVID okay for how <laughs> I'm doing these days. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine given the circumstances and I'm certainly uh, privileged and uh, lucky in comparison to uh, people that are really suffering through the pandemic summer. Um, but like Stephen, it's, it's isolating. You sort of take things day by day and uh, yeah, try not to think too much about uh, how different things are going to be for the upcoming fall semester. Indeed. Yes. Something we've been thinking about a lot, especially as you know, we're intending to use this podcast episode for, for teaching materials for the upcoming semester. Okay. So I'm going to dive right in here, guys, um, and ask you a question about uh, a term we hear a lot about in the study of environmental politics, and that is the commons, or in some cases we hear about common pool resources. Uh, and some of the listeners on this show might be familiar with the idea of the tragedy of the commons, or perhaps they've heard of that term. Um, so I want to take a step back and ask one of you, maybe Matt, if you don't mind, uh, to help us kind of define what a commons is in the first place and how that idea relates to the study of environmental politics. So the, the commons is the idea that, that you have shared resources and whether we're talking about common pool resources or public goods, essentially you have a group of people that are sharing resources and there's technical definitions about who can use the resources and if someone uses the resources, does that um, deplete them or not? But I think the, the general idea is that you have something that's shared in common and when it's applied to climate change, what people are really talking about there, if they say, you know, climate change is a problem of the global commons or is a common pool of resource, it's this notion that in order to have a stable climate, everybody has to contribute action to making that possible. And one of the best ways to, I think, illustrate that is this notion of the carbon budget that people might have seen in the news. So with the carbon budget, scientists have essentially calculated how much carbon dioxide 
humanity can pump into the atmosphere and maintain a stable climate and sort of stay within relatively safe levels. Although what we're seeing these days with climate impacts is that we might already be exceeding some of those safe levels. But essentially that carbon budget, therefore, is the collective or common resource for all of humanity. And so this is what they're really referring to, is that this is something that we share uh, as a community and as a global hmm. community. And in your article, if I can get you to continue, Matt, you you both refer to the global commons as a metaphor for, I, I suppose, the current dominant thinking in, in the governance of climate change. And you emphasize that it hasn't really worked or that this metaphor is maybe problematic. So why isn't the global commons metaphor working when it comes to climate change governance? So one of the, the big issues is if you treat climate change as a problem of the global commons, it creates what we call a collective action problem. And the essential features of that are that everybody has to contribute and that my contribution to the problem, to solving the problem, is essentially dependent on your contribution. So if you aren't going to pay the price to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, then I'm going to feel like I shouldn't either. And so everybody, therefore, is looking at what everybody else is doing. And one of the key features of a collective action problem is that everybody has an incentive to free ride uh, or to essentially let someone else pay the costs of producing the public good in this case, or producing a stable climate of paying for the emissions reductions. And so what you have, if it's a global commons, if climate change, if solving climate change is seen as a global commons, is that everybody is expected to contribute to solve the problem. Everybody has an incentive to free ride to let someone else pay for fixing or, or keeping a stable climate. And in this case, in this particular kind of global commons problem of climate change, you have a lot of major players, the United States, China, India, not really wanting to act or having very different ideas about what to do. And so you have a structure of a problem where everybody has incentive to free ride and you have to overcome that. And you have major players that don't really want to take significant action or have very different ideas about what counts as significant action. And so what we've seen over the last 25 years is this creates uh, an insoluble collective action problem. Interesting. And tell us a, a little bit more about that in, in reference, or maybe I'll, I'll ask Stephen to jump in there. And we, we'll talk about some of the metaphors that you uh, propose or the metaphor that you propose um, as a potential solution but uh, in a second. But you you also raise this idea of carbon lock-in in your article. And I'm wondering maybe, Stephen, if you can tell us a little bit about what that really means. What are some examples of carbon lock-in in different countries? Sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. But maybe I can just uh, step back for just a little bit and, and, and add to some things uh, Matt said. Sure. Um, I, I think that he... Uh, uh, really nicely laid out this this thinking about uh, thinking about a, a stable climate as as a kind of global commons problem, um, and I, I think that one of the things that you know we discuss in the article is that uh, this metaphor of a commons is a very powerful metaphor that is quite useful for hmm. lots of different international problems and. Um, we talk about uh, sort of in a very you know specific way, say something like uh, you know fish stocks um, that have this attribute of commons. You know people have access to them, but you know you can deplete them. Um, mm -hmm. And we think about it even in areas like international trade about this problem of free riding. And you know if one country doesn't lower their tariffs, then another country is is uh, uh, or of cheating, you know, and other countries will not want to do it and so on. And what Matt laid out is the political difficulties with climate change in particular um, of thinking about the problem in this way and getting countries to, to solve it because uh, 
there's all these questions about who is responsible, who is to blame, what's the just solution. Countries uh, are worried that they contribute, another country won't, and they'll be taken advantage of, and so on. But moving now to your question about about lock-in, um, one of the big things that motivated us was that not only is it really difficult if we think about the problem like a commons, whereas other problems, it's kind of good to think about them that way and think about how to get cooperation. Um, but the very nature of climate change, uh, of human-induced climate change, is that the commons doesn't help us very much in thinking about um, the, 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 a, a productive way in which mm. to actually address the underlying problem. And that leads to your question about lock-in. Um, mm. If we think about the, the, what causes carbon lock-in, it's not that states sort of at some point in history decided that they were going to be you know, locked into the use of, of, of fossil fuels or of, of uh, you know, this kind of, of, of energy. Um, it's something that occurred because you know, the internal combustion engine and discovering, uh, you know, lots of oil reserves and different ways to produce energy and, and coal and so on that were um, that were very carbon intensive and economies were built around these things, cultural practices, you know, the, the sort of power and development of states are, are built around them and our own behaviors and our attachment to things like cars and so on and so forth. So there are multiple systems that and behaviors that are locked into the use of carbon. And so when we think about ways to address climate change, as opposed to thinking of states are just going to decide to cooperate or not to deal with it, what we're actually talking about is how to um, overcome carbon lock-in or transform mm -hmm. away from carbon lock-in. And, and that requires um, lots of different things to happen, not just states deciding that that's what they're going to do. Hmm. I, I think if I understand correctly, you suggest that the commons metaphor kind of leads to a particular focus on emissions reductions as opposed to decarbonization, which in, in contrast gets at that issue of, of carbon lock-in. Is that a fair analysis? Is that a fair comparison? Yes, I think that's a, a good way to put it. Um, and I think, and actually I will attribute this this, this, this to Matt because it's his, uh, was you know, uh, way of thinking about it, which I think makes a lot of sense, which is emission reductions are a symptom um, and uh, decarbonization is is sort of the underlying problem and, and gets much more at like, yes, obviously emissions are a, a direct uh, emissions of, of greenhouse gases are, are a direct cause of climate change. Um, but the changes we need aren't simply reducing those emissions. It's changing the systems and practices um, that are leading to those emissions. So then you you turn to in your article and you introduce this idea of the global fractal um, as a new metaphor, uh, and and I think you position this as as a, a different metaphor, a different way of thinking about this challenge, thinking about the challenge of decarbonization rather than just sort of uh, this you know, collective action dilemma about who's going to uh, uh, reduce emissions and why should I reduce emissions if, if that other, you know, country X, Y, and Z aren't reducing their emissions. Um, what can you, can you tell, I mean, that's an interesting concept, this idea of the fractal, where did, where did this idea come from? And what does that really get at this metaphor of the global fractal? And I'll turn that back to you, Matt. Yeah. And so if you start if you change your, your focus from thinking about emissions reductions to thinking about decarbonization, one of the things that you immediately recognize is that lock-in, carbon lock-in, which, by the way, was developed by a sociologist named uh, Gregory Unruh, this concept. But you notice that this lock-in, this dependence on fossil energy, happens at multiple scales. Families you know, sort of households are locked into the use of carbon. Cities are locked into the use of fossil energy, provinces, countries. Hmm. And what you also notice is that they're locked in in similar ways, that at every level, there are overlapping dynamics that are making the use of fossil energy so natural. It's about cultural dynamics. It's about political, social, technological, economic. All of these different forces are overlapping overlapping and reinforcing 
the use of fossil energy. And this is actually quite a clear characteristic of fractal systems. If you look at fractal systems in nature, mm -hmm. whether it's the spiral of a nautilus shell or a river delta, one of the key characteristics of fractal systems is something called self-similarity. And that's the notion that no matter what scale you look at a fractal pattern, it looks the same or it looks very similar. And so we, we noticed that when we, we started thinking about carbon lock-in as the, the core challenge, that lock-in at multiple levels kind of follows similar patterns. And a second piece of, of a fractal system that's really important is that if you look at fractal patterns, they are interdependent across scales. And so micro level patterns reinforce macro level patterns and the reverse is true as well. Macro patterns reinforce micro level patterns. And, and this is certainly the case when it comes to carbon lock-in. So a city like Toronto or Ottawa would be locked into the use of fossil energy because of urban design, available technology or available transportation technologies how citizens choose to move around the city, building codes, mm. utility infrastructure, all these sort of overlapping social, economic, technological, and political factors. Mm. But of course, Canada is locked into the use of fossil energy as well because of industrial policy, histories of resource use, transportation policy, choices made by Canadian consumers. And so you see this sort of similar overlapping dynamics, but of course, the fact that Toronto is locked into carbon reinforces the fact that Canada is locked into carbon mm -hmm. and vice versa, right? And so we saw that this, this notion of a fractal system really seemed to uh, characterize the kind of challenge and the kind of problem that we're facing when it comes to trying to disrupt carbon lock-in and when it comes to ultimately, therefore, trying to move progressively forward on climate change. So just to kind of ground this a little bit, I mean, that, that really makes sense. And I, I really like that imagery of the spiral, these multi-scalar you know, dynamics here where you can have something like an individual, you know, myself, for instance, you know, feeling compelled that I really need that combustion engine vehicle to, uh, to get to work because there's no... Uh, you know, viable public transit systems. And then you go a couple scales up and all of a sudden you have a, a, a provincial or a federal government advocating, you know, saying that we need to continue to, to produce oil to, because people are still buying internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, so, th so I, I think that really helps to explain this I idea of lock-in, but is it so simple to, I don't mean to use that term, but how, how do we then talk about the solution side of things? Because is, is, is the suggestion of the global fractal that the same dynamics that kind of lock us into carbon are the same type of multiscalar relationships that we'll see in the process of decarbonization? Is, so another way of asking that question is, are you proposing that we will see, you know, the, the, the opposite of, of carbon lock-in, so I suppose we could call that decarbonization, is that going to also be a dynamic that we see shared and mutually reinforcing between these different scales? Uh, and I'll, I'll throw that to you, Stephen. So that's the big question, or one big question that Matt and I and, 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 uh, and others uh, really try to get at it in our research. Um, and the I, I guess the... The short answer or short-ish answer is that it is precisely those dynamics that we are looking for um, in multiple sets of initiatives that are being undertaken in order to try to decarbonize. So the, in the same way um, that, as you say, carbon lock-in uh, uh, occurs and is overlapping and reinforcing and so on, we're looking when we look at uh, an initiative, a, a city with a decarbonization plan or, or a particular policy like building codes or carbon labeling or carbon markets, um, when we look, we don't just look at what is the potential of that particular initiative to lead to emission reductions to kind of get back to this difference between reductions and decarbonization. Um, 
we look at whether or not it then can produce dynamics that will have uh, effects that create support for other kinds of policies um, or will build uh, capacity or incentives or knowledge that can then be used to say to scale up that initiative or to um, lead to other kinds of changes that that might be supportive uh, of decarbonization. Um, so we, in fact, are looking at those patterns. And I guess the the, the broader point is that um, our research and others has shown that it's very unlikely that there's going to be a kind of, of, of magic bullet. I mean, what the fractal does imply, uh, and we think is, is, is accurate, is that it's going to take action and initiatives at multiple scales, at multiple levels. And what's important is whether or not these particular initiatives have these, um, you know, recursive and, and kick in these various kinds of, of dynamics that will then lead to the scaling and, and what you know, we call entrenchment, that they'll be sort of durable over time um, that can help undermine or disrupt decarbon or disrupt carbon lock in. Yeah, it's, so it's it's definitely a more complicated um, set of solutions than than a you know a, a single treaty like Kyoto Protocol or a Paris Agreement that we we think is implied by looking at carbon lock-in and decarbonization as the problem. But this is also where the the global fractal is a we think useful metaphor um, if it's if those dynamics are right if if these levels are also interdependent. It's not just the lock-in that's interdependent, sort of reinforcing, where we sort of hypothesize or, or have a conjecture that the interdependence that is locking us into fossil energy can actually be used to, to work for us, to work for decarbonization. So in other words, if you decarbonize Toronto, um, if you're able to put in place the kind of initiatives that Stephen was talking about to, to seriously reduce the dependence on fossil energy in Toronto or Ottawa, that is going to alter what carbon lock-in looks like for the whole country of Canada. Mm -hmm. And so that interdependence, it can be used not just to, to lock systems in, but it also could potentially be used to spread disruption. What Stephen was talking about there in terms of, of scaling and, and entrenchment is the disruption to carbon lock-in Hmm. could spread through a global fractal as well. Right. That's a really interesting idea. And I, I, I've, one other way of referring to that challenge, or I've, I've seen this on social media, but um, the idea that, you know, exponential growth in consumption of, of fossil fuels in particular has kind of gotten us into this mess, but uh, a, a perhaps a more a hopeful way of thinking about getting out of the mess is that we will hopefully see exponential growth in the kinds of solutions and and uh, ways of dealing with with um, carbon lock-in. Uh, I do want to sh shift directions a little bit here um, to well to get back to this issue of the interlocking scales and and maybe you don't. Well, I'm curious to hear your answer on this in particular, Matt. And I know you've written about this a little bit on on social media, but we have discussed with some of the other guests on this podcast the relationship between individual forms of action on climate change and collective scale action or regulatory action. Um, and I know that's not exactly what you're getting at with the, with this different, you know, scales of action in, in terms of the, the fractal, but does that re debate relate at all to the fractal lens of, of uh, decarbonization? Are we, is there, is there a role for the individual? Are they, you know, is the individual, uh, a, uh, a scalar sort of level involved in the, in the uh, global fractal? I think it certainly can be. Um, but I think that one thing that the fractal lens kind of reveals is really the connectedness and, and that we need to get beyond the sort of either or and really think about the connectedness of individual and structural action. Hmm. So if you decide to take individual action – is it disrupting the carbon lock-in in your own life and in any sort of way? Is it reducing the dependence of your household on, on fossil energy? Sometimes yes, sometimes marginally. 
And But even more important, is it possible to see how it can catalyze, even in a small way, disruption of carbon lock-in in broader systems? Hmm. And even sometimes, and this is where some of these debates uh, uh, can get problematic because they <laughs> sort of sometimes veer towards purity debates. Yeah. But they also, I think, unless you start to think about connections, you also don't realize that sometimes action, and this is something that our research reveals, that sometimes actions taken with the best of intentions to decarbonize or or reduce emissions in one place can actually end up um, reinforcing carbon lock-in in in, in other levels. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be, the the fractal forces you to think about those kind of connections, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so, I mean, natural gas is a, this isn't about individuals, but natural gas is a great example of this. Hmm. If we got rid of all coal-fired power plants in North America and switched everything to natural gas, we would reduce emissions. But that actually might end up reinforcing and strengthening the broader carbon lock-in in in our continental energy systems, which might make it even more difficult to Hmm. decarbonize (laughs) and act on climate change. Hmm. And I think people need to think about this at the individual level as well, to be thinking about connections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, What does it, what is it disrupting and what is it reinforcing if I take action to insulate my home more, or if I change my light bulbs or, or fly less, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, most of those things are, are good, but marginal actions to take. But I think that thinking about the connections is a way to get beyond the sort of it's all about individual action and consumer behavior. Right. And we can't do anything, so everybody should just do whatever they want. My reading certainly was that this offers a nice window into the idea of, you know, mutually enforcing behaviors at different scales and that, you know, we can't just pin all our hopes on changes at the level of individual consumption, but that uh, we need to talk about the the interconnectedness between these different scales. And, and you know, it's a good way to put it in terms of making sure that it's not just about one scale or one level of action, but bringing these forms of action to up other scales, upscaling action, if you will. Yeah. Um, okay, so so I want to also get to uh, another question that popped up in, when I was reading your article, which is about the you know how specific we're we're going to be about the the idea of decarbonization, and I uh, I raise this because. Uh, I've recently read a book by Mark Jacquard, who is a colleague of ours at Simon Fraser University, who I'm sure you're both familiar with. Uh, and he has he has sort of claimed that fossil fuels, that, that it's a bit of a myth, uh, and maybe he's being a little provocative, but he does have a, a book titled Sustainable Fossil Fuels, so may, maybe not so much. But he's saying it's a, it's a myth that we need to entirely get rid of fossil fuels, that we need to keep every last drop of fossil f- fuel within within the earth's crust to you know have a stable climate and he's essentially saying he's not you know in favor of, of fossil fuels uh, you know wanton burning of them but he's he's suggesting that the the real issue is about how they relate within the the broader techno technological sphere so if you have a technology like coal uh, a coal-fired power plant that is paired with carbon capture and sequestration, that if you if this system works as it's supposed to and you have uh, the carbon being scrubbed out of this coal and being buried, that the net impact is essentially carbon neutral. So I think he's he's talking about the 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 need to focus on to include a, you know a suite of energy technologies, including fossil fuels, is so long as they're paired with these sort of techno fixes which can allow us to to maintain carbon neutrality so that's a long way of asking Stephen. i'll turn this to you do we you know is there is there a role for fossil fuels some limited amount of fossil fuels in a decarbonized world or do we really need to start thinking about how we're literally going to keep every last drop of fossil fuels, maybe not today, maybe not in the next five, 10 years, but eventually see a world where we are not digging any of this stuff up and burning it. 
So thank you, Ryan, for turning to me for the very simple question. <laughs> um, and, you know, Mark Jacquard's a very smart guy. Um, and, and, and these are challenging arguments. So I, I, I guess I, I, I'm, I feel like I, this might be a bit of sidestepping it, but <laughs> it, it's maybe a slightly different way of, of, of looking at it. Okay. So I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, one is that I think, as in Matt's answer to a previous question, it's it, it may not be productive to have these kinds of either or debates. Hmm. Um, I don't think uh, anyone um, would would imagine that we can just uh, you know tomorrow say that we're no longer going to use fossil energy. Hmm. Um, uh, so I, I think there is an, an acknowledgement that um, even as we build, even as we go through a transformation, which which I hope that we do, and there's some evidence that we're at least starting to, um, that there there will be a, you know, fossil fuels will hopefully be a, a d- diminishing part of our uh, sort of our infrastructure and energy um, use and so on, um, but that that there. There's going to be, um, you know, a, a various amount of time when when th- they'll be part of the mix. Um, but to kind of switch the discussion just a little bit, there's a couple of important things to take in mind, which is where maybe I don't quite agree hmm. with with uh, Jacquard. Hmm. So the first is is that um, time is running out, hmm. and I think that there is a, a danger in framing the discussion in in the way that he does. Uh, to sort of say, well, then, you know, the, the policy response is, oh, well, okay, they're always going to be here. So, um, you know, let's not panic. Let's not uh, sort of have these sort of radical solutions, everything in the ground, that's that's misplaced. Mm-hmm. Um, when I think that that the science tells us that indeed, quick, very, very rapid in, in historical terms, transformation is needed. And we're just naive. It doesn't matter what we think and whether we have these debates or not. The science tells us climate change will occur, and it's occurring at a very, very rapid pace. Mm. The second thing um, that I think is important to keep in mind is that these kinds of discussions then tend to lead to, well, what do we have to do then? And I think that's one of the areas in which uh, Matt, the, the work that Matt and I are doing, tries to change that discussion from. Here's a suite of policies uh, that we have, you know, we have to have a carbon price. We have to reduce emissions by this much. Companies should do this. So, you know, um, countries should do that. And laying out, and here's the carbon budget. And so by 2050, we need to do this and so on and so forth. It's not that that stuff isn't helpful or accurate in terms of if we did that, it would lead to the kinds of world that we want. Um, our work goes from the opposite perspective. So whether or not Mark is right or not, mm-hmm. that carbon sequestration would work, um, which, you know, the evidence so far is that certainly not on the scales that he's talking about mm-hmm. doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, it switches it to say, what do we need to do to intervene in the system in order to get the transformation going that needs to happen? Mm-hmm. And what are the politics around that in, in particular? Um, what are the changes? What what kinds of things are leading to the kinds of changes that are necessary? So rather than having a, a abstract debate about whether carbon sequestration is going to work, we would say, what do we need to do to start transitioning um, a, a away from fossil energy, hmm. and um, and to get support for if if the kinds if the if you know there's still going to be need for coal, well to get the kind of support and money and investment. Um, hmm. That would either, uh, you know, that that would that would be required in order to do the kinds of things that um, Mark thinks might be necessary in terms of if there mm-hmm. if, if fossil energy remains remains part of the mix, and that's why we look at the politics, you know, of, of coalitions of kind of normalizing how you gain support, how you gain capacity um, in all kinds of different areas, and we think the fractal is is useful for that hmm. purpose. Yeah. I, I won't leave Stephen hanging on this one because mm-hmm. uh, I, I agree with him. Uh, I'm I'm really, and I may preface this by saying I'm not a sort of expert on the economics of CCS, mm-hmm. but I'm wary of 
quote unquote solutions that promise we'll be okay without transformation. Mm. Because if, if global scientists, climate scientists are correct, and we really need 80% reductions in emissions and essentially to be fully decarbonized by, by mid-century, uh, I worry what these kind of bridge type solutions that say we can keep doing what we're doing if we do this other technological thing. Mm. Or we're going to do this other, we're going to keep doing what we're doing, but we'll do it with a slightly lower emissions uh, fossil fuel energy. My worry is always do those, or the, the litmus test I, I think of is do taking those solutions or, you, or following those solutions, do they make it easier or harder mm. to generate and pursue transformation? Mm. The kind of transformation we need in our energy systems, tra transportation systems, societies, really. Mm. Because we do need um, some f fairly significant transformation. Mm. And, and the second point I'll make is that a, a lot of these are solutions that are essentially maintaining status, the status quo or, or supporting the status quo. And there's a, a lot of reasons to not support the status quo along the, some of these, for some of these technologies, regardless of climate change. Mm, yeah. Yeah. The coal industry is, is, is not great <laughs> for labor, for other environmental issues, mm. for other health issues. Similarly, a lot of the fossil fuel industry is not great for societal equity, for justice, for issues of, of race and uh, damage to indigenous communities. And so I, I look at the necessity of having transformation that's not just about climate change, but it's about justice and, and equity as well. And so I, I, I'm wary of solutions that promise that the status quo is going to continue and that that will help us get to transformation. Hmm. Yeah. I and mean, it's certainly a, an interesting debate. And I think one of the motivations, I don't want to be putting words in his, or sentiments into, into his mouth, but um, you know, I think one of the, the thing, the concerns is that sometimes a politics of transformation, and that is a loaded term that I suppose we could define in different ways, but I think sometimes it scares people and it's it's uh the idea of having to you know change our our lives you know drastically change our behavior and change the way we go about doing everything you know our, our regular life um is something that that you know as as a counter argument is sometimes leveled as one of these reasons why we need to you know maybe be a bit careful about the way that we're we're free framing transformation or the idea of the scale of change that we need. But it sounds to me like you're both uh, unequivocal that, you know, we really do need to be open to the idea of transformation. Is that is uh, of, you know, revolutionary scale transformation. Is that a fair claim, Matt? Yeah, I, I would say, and I, I, I would add two things to it. I think you summed that up well, I, but I would add two things to this. First is that, uh, we're seeing transformation whether we want it or not. Mm. I think that the, the evidence of climate impacts is just ever growing and the speed at which we're facing transformation of our world is becoming ever more clear. And the, the second thing I would say, and this is I've, I sort of unapologetically but with credit steal from a colleague of ours, Simon Dalby, mm. um, at, at Wilfrid Laurier University. He's fond of asking... Uh, about this very kind of question, well, what's really the radical position? Is the radical position we continue a status quo that is essentially doing vast amounts of damage to the planet and to many communities? Or is the radical position to ch stop doing mm. that? And I'm, I'm with him. I think the radical position is actually to continue doing, to continue pursuing the status quo mm when we know that the status quo is damaging. Well, truth be, be told, I'm with him too. He was actually my PhD supervisor. So thanks for the shout out to Simon. <laughs> uh, okay, I have a, a final question for both of you. Um, and I, I, we try to end these episodes by asking about, you know, your hopes about the future. And, you know, we don't want to 
you don't have to be, uh, you know, be honest here, but we were kind of wondering about um, ways that you remain hopeful or, or maybe techniques or things that you think about that make you hopeful about the future in particular around the idea of, you know, confronting climate change. And maybe one way to introduce this question is to go back to this idea of the metaphor that you invoked in your article. So you guys, you know, the stated purpose or one of the stated purposes of your, your article is to provide new metaphors for international climate governance in part because some of the previous metaphors and lenses haven't worked. So starting with you, Stephen, are you hopeful that new ways of confronting the challenge of climate change will help us get out of this mess? So I should preface this by say I don't like the word hope <laughs> or despair for that, for, for that matter. Um, because I think that one of the the things that uh, uh, has motivated me in, in in the research is is to try to think very practically. Um, I, d- I don't know what what's going to happen, and and I sort of go back and forth. And I think that as I was saying before, I react very much uh, against sort of this you know predicting here's a solution we can do that or we can't do that. So we should either go full force into it or just give up. And I, and I, I, I worry about that, um, that mentality. I think what gives me motivation to continue to do this research and to, to, to think that, uh, you know, human societies are quite innovative, it can be quite innovative and adapt. And even in very tough times when things look very bleak, um, uh, you know, f- find ways, uh, out of things, or at least to move forward, um, is precisely in in the research that we do. One of the reasons that I I like the goal, the idea of the global fractal is that, in my view, it is actually describing how, at least in the last ten years, if not in the earliest days of climate change concern, um, how it, how we as a species, I guess, um, are indeed responding to this crisis. Um, we are seeing hundreds, thousands of initiatives all over the world, mm-hmm. attempts to deal with it, some quite on a large scale, some on a small scale. Um, those alone are not going to do very much um, necessarily. Um, there's not a magic bullet. But seeing that there is a, a widening recognition and efforts and investment and concern and individuals and the mobilization of of young people um, and concerns about how this uh, uh, affects different communities who are suffering now because of climate change, as Matt was talking about, um, these things moving together and again, kind of thinking of thinking through how the politics of that can lead to a, a, a scaling of action and learning from each other and um, entrenching new ways of doing things, uh, that to me is where I look for in terms of continuing to work on this problem and finding ways to uh, move forward to address it. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm a little less uh, allergic to the word hope, but, uh, but, I, but mostly because I take my understanding of hope from, uh, from Rebecca Solnit, a uh, historian and, and public intellectual who's written a lot about hope and despair. Because what she talks about hope is the uncertainty of what's going to happen, of sort of embracing uncertainty. That despair is knowing things are going to be bad, and optimism is knowing things are going to be good. And hope is found in this, the uncertainty that you're not exactly sure what the, the future is going to hold. And, and it's that space of uncertainty that provides the opportunity for action. And, and like Stephen, I, I find that uncertainty um, and motivation to keep working on this precisely the, the same place he does, that there are thousands of initiatives, thousands and millions of people working on transformation, and that this has become a truly global response to climate change in ways that have gone so far beyond the sort of classic multilateral negotiations that really characterized climate politics for the first from so you know the early late 1980s through the early 2000s 
And, and so this is, I, I don't know if it's all going to work, <laughs> but at least I think that the, the response is starting to match mm. the nature and magnitude of the challenge. Mm. And we've got a, a long way to go to be sure, but I, I, I at least see some uncertainty there um, that, that gives me some hope. Okay. Well, maybe we will leave it there and end on that note. Um, thank you guys so much for joining in on this uh, episode and, and serving as guests uh, for the EcoPolitics podcast. I uh, really enjoyed hearing your thoughts and just kind of working through your article, which I really enjoyed uh, reading last fall when it came out. Um, and to just kind of talk about the ins and outs of decarbonization and carbon lock-in in a, in, a, in a deeper way than I think we usually do on a daily basis. So thank you guys so much. Really appreciate uh, your time and for sharing your thoughts and wisdom uh, with us. So I, I will wrap it up there. Uh, that concludes this episode of the EcoPolitics podcast. Uh, don't forget to check out other episodes in the series at ecopoliticspodcast.ca and Matt, Stephen, thank you once again. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you very much.